Uh, today we are doing a bit of introspection as well as some sort of contemplation and also uh, a philosophical approach on advocacy our profession we have one of the best speakers around and thanks especially to justice somaya jalu sir for uh, introducing this wonderful speaker uh, uh, to this platform so this being a thoroughly informal platform wherein we don't waste time on anything other than discussions deliberations and of course conflicts and confrontations if necessary directly over to somaya jalu sir for a brief introduction of the speaker thank you so much it's such a pleasure good to see you murli uh, friends murli nilkanthan is one of the most distinguished uh, alumni of uh, the national law university bangalore an outstanding student from e after graduating he worked abroad for a large number of years in one of the, some of the leading firms in the world then later he qualified as a solicitor so today is both a solicitor and an indian lawyer entitled to practice in england but uh, after practicing and working for a number of years in the, all over the world he has come back and uh, settled down in bombay where he was also a partner in kaitan and co one of india's largest firms earlier he was the group general counsel at sipla an executive director of glenmark the general counsel at glenmark man with very very wide and vast experience despite all his learning despite all his travels despite the big places where he worked the big clients he represented he still remains a very very grounded human being deeply gets himself deeply engrossed in cricket a fine lover of south indian coffee and my father tells me some of the finest coffee he ever had was in murli sahib in bombay <laughs> despite all his achievements he is a, a wonderful human being a man who walks if i may say so with equal felicity both among the princes and the paupers so with these few words i'll introduce you to murli nilakantan i am looking forward to listen to him also thank you thank you very much this is samya jil sir this uh, uh, the common ground i we could now understand cricket wonderful <laughs> so uh, the pitch is yours you can do the batting bowling fielding all over to you sir murli nilakanth sir all all round performance <laughs> all round performance <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you very much for your very kind words just to somya jalu uh, and thank you very much to all of you for inviting me uh, you know you said uh, that uh, cricket was something that was of common interest it was also very important for me uh, the game itself was very important for me when i was in the uk because i was a young lawyer with no friends uh, in the uk or even colleagues and so cricket was my way of actually getting into the social system <laughs> of the firm and the united kingdom and thankfully with a name like murli at that time uh, you know <laughs> there is a natural advantage <laughs> and people uh, people <laughs> expect that you can bowl ah uh, you people expect that uh, with a name like murli if you are reasonably tall and you can bowl a bit the ball will spin <laughs> whether it does or not uh, you can you can be reasonably successful as a cricketer uh, so you know with just uh Bye. but uh, my uh talk today is largely about my experiences so uh the word of caution i add here is that uh, these are my experiences as i experience them many others may have different experiences and uh, i am hoping that people will not take this too personally as negating their personal experience so uh, you know it's just a word of caution for all those who are listening that uh, i am not judging you so please don't judge me uh i'll start off with what we hold ourselves out to be which is that we hold ourselves out to be a noble profession and what it means if it was any other trade or calling then we would have the same ethical rules as the rest of society so i think of it as because we are a noble profession and we hold ourselves out to be a noble profession we are expected 
to follow a higher standard which means there are some inviolable ethical rules now you can say what are those rules what is the basis of that is there is it like religion with rules and for a large extent i try to think of it and some wise man very long ago in my uh, life when i was studying sanskrit summarized to me what religion all over the world was and i think a lot of that applies to if you use that simple four words uh, much of what i will be saying will fit within it and he said when i was really struggling with sanskrit uh, as a young boy he said listen you have to start off by understanding that the basic principle is satyam vada dharmam chara so if you follow these four words then everything else falls into place it took me many years later when i was practicing law in the uk to put this in a perspective of a different society with what i thought were very different rules so i'll start with a simple example that a uh, client comes to us tells us his story and then we immediately think yes 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 this fits within case x or case y or that precedent or that order he continues to tell the story we continue to add a few more cases and then we find that there are some facts that he is saying which is not fitting beautifully into the our case into the winning case that we have in our mind so then we either discard the facts or we persuade the client that yes 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 but you know that is also happening with you isn't it so then the client obviously takes that hint and the facts beautifully fit into precedent then we go to court and say my lord it is squarely covered by so and so case in supreme court it's a very common thing we have all seen it uh, i have seen it right from the labor court upwards to the supreme court so it is true here likewise with verification of pleadings and i will show uh, how it is different in practice between what happens in india what happens in the uk the principle is the same that the solicitor will verify the pleadings they have somewhat updated the language of the procedure code there and so today it is the statement of the solicitor about the case so in my case it would be a statement of murli nilakanthan so there will be a claim there will be a statement that i will make about the case and there will be witness statements by all the clients one of my first cases there uh, involved rolls royce and it was a very very unusual case for us shareholders and indian shareholders of an indian company had instituted derivative action in an english court so it, it is something that you are unlikely to see uh, even having practiced company law for a long time which is a derivative action of a foreign company in a foreign court when i had to write the statement uh, in that case the clients were very upset with me they were saying murli are you our counsel or the other side's counsel why are you cross examining us and why are you not putting everything that we are saying accurately and so i had to explain to them that as an officer of the court i have a duty to the court i have a duty to the other side in india unfortunately uh, there is no risk of punishment for perjury so the clients and the lawyers feel fairly safe and immune from any prosecution for perjury whereas in the uk if those of you of a particular age might remember the case of jeffrey archer now apart from him being well known as an author of novels he was also a politician and he was in many ways stated to be the next prime minister of the united kingdom at that time when he was uh, in public life as a politician one of the magazine one of the newspapers uh, ran a story saying that uh, he was having uh, he was seen with a prostitute and he was uh, visiting prostitutes a case came in court where uh, the newspaper settled 
and withdrew and paid damages to Jeffrey Archer. So you think, okay, so what happened? Subsequently, it was discovered that it was true, and Jeffrey Archer, in fact, had lied to the court in his statement about that case. So this is a case where the newspaper was sued, lost, paid damages. Subsequently, discovered that they lost because of a lie. Now, Lord Archer, as he then was, then went to prison for what you might think of as a fairly common lie. Any man visiting a married man visiting a prostitute, especially a politician, will perhaps be expected to lie in whichever country. But that is not the standard. It was just an inviolable standard that you cannot lie. And as a result of it, he went to jail. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that the rules of practice are the same. Words might be different, but the principle is the same. You're an officer of the court. You owe duty to the other side. You owe duty to the court. You owe duty to the client. The consequence of this rule and the outcome that you have in two different countries is such a stark difference. The other case I will take to you, which is a reported case, it is uh, SSL versus TTK. Again, in the uh, High Court as well as the Court of Appeal, where the English company sued an Indian company for breach of contract and a whole lot of other things. The Indian company chose to remain ex parte. The requirement of the rules there for litigation is that before you sue someone, you're expected to exchange correspondence called pre-action correspondence. So the whoever is the claimant will write to the potential defendant and say, this is my case and include all the documents, everything in it. So uh, it is the whole case is presented to the potential defendant. And the potential defendant then writes to say, this is our case. And it is done with full disclosure. There are no exceptions. So except for privilege, everything else has to be disclosed. And to the extent it's privileged, you have to state that it is privileged. Now you might think, therefore, it should be a fairly open and shut case where the uh, foreign entity is a defendant, is brought before the court, remains ex parte. Obviously, the plaintiff will win. But here is how it is different. That the plaintiff in that case, or claimant as he's called in the uh, UK, went to court, there was a trial, and the plaintiff lost in the high court, sought leave to appeal to the court of appeal, denied, went to the court of appeal seeking leave to appeal, denied, sorry, granted, court of appeal hears it and dismisses the appeal. Now, you might think, how is this even possible? It is possible because when the counsel for the claimant makes out his case, he will make it out fairly, which means he will also have to set out what are the failings in his case and what is the case of the other side. Now, many of you have been in practice for 20 years or more, uh, and I'd be curious to know how many cases in India you would find where a plaint is presented to a court, the defendant remains ex parte, and uh, the uh, case is lost by the plaintiff. Now, the reason for that is what are the ethics and what is the duty of the officer of the court? And in that, in that case, we see very clearly that to the extent that the case is weak in certain aspects, there is an admission of that in court very fairly by the QCs. Now, I'll contrast that uh, with a case that cricket lovers will remember. In 2003, India was to play the World Cup in South Africa. The sponsors of the World Cup were South African Airways. 
At that time, the sponsor of the Indian team was Sahara, which also had an airline business. <coughs> and therefore, there was a conflict because the Indian team, by the rules of the tournament, could not be wearing a kit that was sponsored by a competitor, which is any airline. So this could this was purely a commercial issue between the uh, ICC and the BCCI. But what happened? Some very eminent cricketers, namely the great uh, Siddharth Shankar Ray, a uh, well-known cricketer, uh, went to the Delhi High Court along with NKP Salve and filed a writ claiming that there is a fundamental right of Indians to watch India play in the World Cup in South Africa. This is the claim made in that petition. But in reality was that it was purely a commercial issue regarding the terms of participation in a tournament. Now, the Delhi High Court heard the matter. The uh, writ petition was settled by the current Attorney General. Mr. K.K. Venugopal, also one of my seniors. And it was argued for many months. All eyes of the world were on this case. Now, uh, in the SSL TTK case, I was acting for the defendant. In the NKP Salvi versus Union of India, I was acting for the International uh, Cricket Council. Now, how do I explain to the ICC that this writ petition doesn't have a chance of success, even though it has been settled by a very eminent senior counsel, that uh, it is completely baseless. It will be dismissed eventually, but it will cause nuisance. Because in the UK, they cannot understand that such cases can be filed, especially on fundamental rights. The High Court will actually admit it. So first, it can be filed. It will be settled by a QC and it will actually be admitted and it will actually be argued. So it is a very difficult thing for people like me to have to explain how the system works. Do we not have the same rules of practice? Are we? Is it not a noble profession? Are we not officers of the court? Eventually, it got dismissed many months later after having almost you know, the top 20 counsel at that time were all on one side. Uh, acting for various parties, Sahara, uh, Coke, Pepsi, everybody was involved in it because it involved all these issues. So I think uh, from these examples, you can figure out that the rules of practice are the same. We follow the same ethical rules, but the outcomes are different. And that imposes a huge burden on lawyers providing advice. Now, uh, I have struggled with this issue to explain why it is happening. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, uh, there is a book by Devdutt Patnaik called Business Sutras, which tries to explain how Indians deal with business, truth, morality, and some of these aspects and how it plays out. Now, we talk about professional integrity as being the heart of uh, us as a noble profession. An interesting aspect of professional integrity uh, in the US is what is called positional conflict. It was a big surprise to me to hear it uh, when I was a partner in an American firm. The concept of positional conflict is that every lawyer has to take a position on law. So if you say, for example, that a provision is unconstitutional, that is your opinion. Whether you have expressed it in a, a writ petition, whether you have expressed it in an article, whether you have expressed it in an opinion, that is your position. Now, you can't the next day or a few hours later appear on the opposite side for the state of Kerala and say, no, 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 it's perfectly constitutional and uh, here is how it is constitutional. To me, it exemplified what it means to be a professional versus being a trader, which is, I will sell anything that makes me a profit. Now, 
I understand how difficult it is for uh, those of us who practice in India to explain this to someone else. But for the rest of the world, they expect to know what you as a lawyer believe and have an opinion on a particular provision of law or a particular proposition. Now, it's again one where we may need to think whether as a profession and as professionals, we need to make clear what our opinion on a certain matter is. It doesn't mean you can't change your opinion for good reason. It just means that you can't flit on both sides uh, depending on who the client is. Now, the result of this is that a lot of uh, lawyers will refuse briefs for the opposite proposition or the conflicting proposition. And so clients know very clearly where you stand on a position of law. It also means that, at least in India, that when you make a proposition to a judge or to a client, it is very clear that you have thought about it, you are convinced about it, and that is your position. And therefore, there is a aspect of professional integrity with positional conflict. Now, uh, the second aspect of uh, our profession is ethics as the basis of unwavering trust. I'll give a very simple example. Uh, most of the rules of practice uh, here and elsewhere require the separation of office money and client money. So, for example, the fees that you get will be office money and uh, let's say court fee, stamp duty, all of those will be client monies. But it's been my experience that there are several practices that uh, are lawyers who don't distinguish the two. They have only one bank account. And that is their personal bank account. And both monies get mixed up in that. So there is a risk that uh, client monies may not be available to return to the client. And uh, if you ask many clients, once they have paid the money to the lawyer, they don't expect it back. Now, the contrast in the UK is that uh, you will be disbarred if you indulge in anything like this. So even a penny moves to the wrong account, you're in trouble. And there is no uh, flexibility or uh, indulgence shown there. The other issue is undertakings. Uh, often we are asked in court to provide undertakings. Now I'll give you an example of an undertaking in the UK which happened to me. So the rule is that the solicitor's undertaking is unconditional and inviolable. So I was in, I was a young lawyer at that time, more than 25 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, where the uh, corporate transaction for purchase of shares was meant to close on a Friday, it could not close. And therefore, the uh, clients said we will have to now en engage into an escrow arrangement with the bank so that we can deposit the shares, then the uh, buyer will deposit the money. And when both are done, then the shares will go to the buyer and the money to the seller. But all this was a complicated transaction because there were several transactions to be completed before this happened. And those were delayed for some reason because it was across countries and payments were taking a little more time. So the uh, solicitor for uh, the other side suggested that this is all too complicated. We are already on Friday. We cannot negotiate an escrow agreement by tonight. The suggestion is simply this, that we will just trust Murli with the money and we will wire it to the clients, uh, the uh, law firm's uh, client account. And uh, when the transaction is completed, the shares and monies will be exchanged. Now, you might think, oh, that's a little scary. Millions of dollars. Can we trust the other side's lawyers with my clients millions of dollars? And that was a question that was asked by the other side uh, to its solicitors. And here is what uh, was heartwarming. That solicitor said that there is a small chance that a bank may go bankrupt. But there is no chance that a solicitor's undertaking will not be performed. So that is the level of trust 
that the profession has earned amongst itself and amongst others that we are willing to actually stake our life and reputation to protect what we believe are our ethics now you can contrast that with uh, undertaking for costs in case of injunctions in india <laughs> and how many of you have ever managed to get an undertaking and enforce an undertaking and actually get costs uh, but i contrast that with it whereas if you had to get an injunction in the uk you have to make an undertaking for costs uh, and the undertaking will be cashed and there are no exceptions so you can't say listen my client didn't pay me so i can't fulfill my undertaking uh, that is not acceptable if you make an undertaking come hell or high water to use an insurance phrase the uh, the undertaking will be cashed now having said all this uh, i don't want it to look like uh, we are terrible and they are great uh, but i do want to think about the insecurities that we have about the legal profession uh, we seem to be very worried that foreign lawyers will come into india uh, they will take away our uh, clients you know uh, they will not be able to do justice and i will just say this that uh, foreign lawyers have been in the uk for more than 30 years and they have not taken away work from english solicitors Uh, they have come from the united states they have come from europe they were all set up in london and they have not taken away any work but we have to ask ourselves why is it that we feel this insecurity why is it that we don't react when there is a creeping encroachment by chartered accountants and company secretaries so we have chartered accountants who are drafting documents we have company secretaries who are giving opinions Uh, chartered accountants and company secretaries are appearing tax tribunal tax tribunals nclt every tribunal you can think of uh, consumer forum everywhere they are appearing we don't feel that that is encroachment but we are worried that some two <laughs> english guys will come from overseas will set up a practice here and make the millions that we are not making now look at how it is working in the uk that you have senior advocates here who have become qcs there we have other lawyers like me who are practicing english law in english courts and uh, uh, in corporate work they don't feel that uh, insecurity they don't feel that we are taking away their work so if they have managed so well are we feeling so insecure that some uh, four or five white guys or a 400 white guys are going to be so enthralled by the humongous profits that they can make in the indian legal profession that they will come over here and uh, ruin all our practices it's the question for us how do we think about others how do we think about our own profession and how we feel about our profession if we feel insecure about our profession we have to ask why we feel that now the profession has changed for centuries and uh, for those of you who are interested in literature uh, i would uh, recommend to you read english classics a little more carefully a lot of the uh, elizabethan and victorian stories at least the more popular ones in india will make reference to a solicitor in every family story in fact you would find that the families trusted their solicitors more than they trusted their own children especially the rich landed gentry and they expected the solicitor will do justice uh, to the will and to ensure that there is peace if there is uh, any disagreement within the family so and solicitors are one class the priests are another and the third is the village doctor so if there are three professions these are the three noble professions that you will find have pride of place in english classics now what happened over time the solicitor who was the friend philosopher and guide to the family got replaced by the banker 
and you will see this again in the uh, in the literature that you know banks are the bank manager is becoming a significant figure so we gave up the role we had of being friend philosopher and guide and clients then went and trusted their bankers and the bankers obviously got a bad reputation so then who replaced them it became the accountants but look at what it is that clients go to the bankers and accountants for today clients go to accountants as keepers of secrets and they are not pleasant secrets so we still i still think that lawyers have a role to play in society with their clients and if we can redeem ourselves our reputation then we should not fear clients going to bankers or accountants if we can win back their trust as their friend philosopher and guide uh, i think the older generation from us will see will remember what pride of place lawyers had in communities uh, and the lawyer was a public figure uh, today we are just like the rest of society we are just private individuals and it's something for us to contemplate what it will take for us to win back that position in society as public individuals uh, what can we do to recapture that space that is truly ours we are set up for it and we have abdicated it now i'll deal with one other aspect which is public service uh, and i'm glad that uh, justice somya julu is here uh, i had the privilege of knowing his father briefly uh, and you know it's an example of what uh public service means in the uk uh, leading lawyers will be members of tribunals will be ad hoc judges and uh this i can't think of one qc who's not been a recorder which is the equivalent of a high court judge in civil matters uh to help deal with cases now you might think oh this is a very unusual thing but uh, those of you who have read the constitution quite carefully will remember a provision that has been lost for a very long time still exists on paper which allows uh lawyers to be appointed on an ad hoc basis and there is precedent for it uh precedent before our time but uh, i would just suggest if somebody reads up the life of justice vivian bose you will find that something similar happened where he was brought out of retirement to be a judge now 25 years ago there was a petition from the bombay bar uh, then led by uh, senior counsel uh, ikbal chagla to the chief justice to say that senior lawyers are willing to give up a year or two of their practice to be appointed as ad hoc judges so that the old cases or cases that are 20 years old and more can all be disposed of so that we don't deal with the high value cases we deal with the cases that the common man is suffering from so we deal with on the criminal side you know people who not uh, who been under trials for 7 years 8 years 10 years we deal with small matters that affect them uh, the consumer forum matters on appeal which have come uh, we deal with uh, small causes matters we deal with rent land acquisition matters that affect the common man so nothing dramatic uh, no great constitutional matters is going to be done by these ad hoc judges but we can get rid of old cases which affect the common man and affect our perception of justice now the idea still is good sadly for us uh, the appointments to tribunals are uh, to put it very mildly pathetic uh, we choose not to have members who have any knowledge in fact it seems to be a qualification that if you don't know the subject you will be appointed to that tribunal Uh, i give the example of the recent appointments last year to the nclt uh, you have a district judge from gorakhpur I mean, unlikely he would have even seen a company he would have seen a memorandum or articles of the company or ever dealt with the company matter 
but he's going to be a judicial member of the uh, national company law tribunal so this is the state and we have a chance to actually provide a public service uh, to the system of justice in this country and say we have a duty to justice and we are willing to give up you know so let's say 6 months in a year 4 months in a year uh, for a period of 2 or 3 years to sit and deal with this lot of cases uh, i would recommend some of you taking this on again it is not a new idea uh, i don't claim to be the author of the idea but it's an idea which i believe has a chance to promote justice and there are i believe enough of us who will be willing to serve for no pecuniary gain and perhaps that is the problem that as soon as somebody shows a flickering of altruism we are looking for an ulterior motive because we don't believe that lawyers can be altruistic so perhaps we need a few role models of lawyers who are willing to show true altruism and say uh, you know let us try this every high court let's have four or five senior counsel who are willing to do this and perhaps that will gain some credibility uh, for the system itself the second matter which i will take up is pro bono that uh, i know now that uh, for the last few years uh, when lawyers are being elevated to the bench uh, questions are asked about their pro bono work which is very welcome in the west uh, pro bono has reached a level where uh, large corporate clients will not hire a law firm unless they have shown commitment to pro bono so you are expected when you are pitching for work to provide details of the pro bono work all your lawyers have done and the pro bono work is not just in court so some of it may be court but it could be in community in the society itself so it is helping a school uh with its own policies it's helping uh, a foundation get tax relief it is helping a foundation build schools it's uh, helping with charity work a lot of it requires legal support and lawyers can provide very good service in many of these matters uh, a lot of them have difficulties with just basic paperwork and i'm sure a lot of our juniors will benefit from understanding how a cooperative society works uh, how a uh, charitable uh, foundation works or a charitable trust works uh, what are the aspects of setting it up management of it supervision of it tax other matters so it's a great training ground for lawyers uh, it's a great use to society and during that period uh, that i was there a lot of clients really appreciated it and a lot of clients participated in these activities uh, which you call csr here so there was a chance for lawyers and clients to work together on some of these projects and build those relationships the third aspect of public service is amicus briefs uh, in any case before the united states supreme court you will find not just the parties who submit briefs and will argue but there will be several public spirited lawyers together with academics so it is unlikely that you will find any brief where the key legal brains of that country do not participate what does this do it means that we are participating in the progress of law we are not particularly interested in the dispute itself but we want the judges to understand what is the consequence of resolving this dispute so it is not as much as saying okay x1 or y1 but to explain to the judges that if x wins what are the consequences that flow from it for the rest of society now i will take three examples a four perhaps the case of Novartis versus the Union of India is very important for patent lawyers for healthcare activists where in fact the uh, core idea came from Professor Shamnath Bashir uh, 
uh, those of you who don't know him i would recommend please look him up uh, in fact the book uh, where this uh, talk originated is a chapter in the in it and it's dedicated to dr menon and uh, professor shamnath bashi and all the proceeds of the sale of the book go to a foundation established by uh, shamnath bashi but the heart of novartis was on evergreening of patents and that argument was placed by shamnath before the supreme court the second case where it should have happened and did not happen is in the 2g matters before the supreme court now the supreme court said that the licenses were wrongly issued and we'll cancel them but what are the consequences of cancelling a license what happens to the network what happens to the financing what happens to the investment made by foreign entities none of that was discussed nobody bothered to bring that up before the judges now as a consequence of that all the claims by the foreign investors are against the government of india and they're likely to succeed so when the government thought it, the court thought it was doing good it did not realize that the government may have to pay out a few billion dollars as a consequence of it the next case the last one i will pick is the case of sahara now clearly uh, there is a reason for a very good reason for what the supreme court did to the management of sahara but nobody told the judges in the uh, sahara case that if you say these things look at the impact it will have on corporate law so for example one of the propositions is that uh, if you issue shares to more than 50 people it is a public issue and a public issue requires approval by sebi and a listing on the exchange oh, very well it all makes sense now if i microsoft and i'm issuing esops to my indian employees what happens now and when the esops are cashed and become shares of microsoft is that an offer for shares in india does it have to be listed in india how will a foreign company that is already listed overseas now list in india is there a provision for that uh, in the rules that we have to list it? now none of that was ever considered they were focused on what to do with sahara so nothing came out from the bar or from the academics to tell the judges that yes 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 you will resolve this dispute it's it's a notorious case but think of the consequences if you said what you said without considering uh, what the outcomes are going to be for the rest of the world now this should not come as a surprise uh, for those of you who may have uh, read the biographies of some of the leading lawyers especially uh, nani palkiwala uh, he was involved in almost all the leading cases during his time and one of his tricks was to ensure that anybody who had any case which was an important likely to be an important case they would tell palkiwala about it and whether he was briefed by that client or not he would find a way of intervening in that matter in you know, whether it's a sales tax matter or it's a constitutional law matter any matter where he thought it was important significant issue of law he would find a way of getting into it now he since we don't have a formal process of filing amicus briefs intervention was a way of doing it now sadly the uh, interveners have got a bit of a bad reputation in the last few years but it is something for the profession and the judges to consider whether they will benefit from this now even if they don't benefit from the intervention and somehow it is not happening nothing prevents lawyers from teaching and writing now how many lawyers actually write good academic pieces that judges can refer to and say ah this is how the law is progressing or this is how the law can progress this is these are the potential directions for a particular law or a particular proposition i will leave you with one which uh, has been cited in the, uh, by the supreme court in the privacy case which is the concept of privacy 
came from an article, a law review article uh, written by Justice Brandeis. And to this day, for almost 50 years, 70 years now, that has shown the light and the path for the growth of privacy law. Now, there's no reason why senior lawyers, younger lawyers cannot write academic pieces. Thankfully, in the recent years, uh, judges with their law clerks are actually looking for these pieces. So, you know, if you see the judgments of uh, Justice Chandrachud recently, he's referred to even blogs. He's referred to a spicy IP blog. He's referred to a few other blogs. So it doesn't have to be 5,000 or 10,000 words, uh, even if it is 2,000 words and uh, it is not uh, written in strong legalese, it's easy to read. It will still give a chance for us to participate in the progress of law, even if we don't appear in those cases. Uh, I would recommend, you know, there is a lot of knowledge within the bar that is not available to the bench and not available to justice. So perhaps this is one where uh, the more we write, uh, we have a chance to shape the law. Uh, lastly, I will go to teaching. Somehow, uh, there, had, there was a tradition of teaching. And uh, I think those of us of a previous generation will have benefited from lawyers coming to teach us uh, and judges. Uh, in fact, uh, in the early years of the National Law School, it was unlikely that at any course, there would not be a lawyer teaching us, uh, especially procedure, but also constitutional law. So we had uh, Justice uh, Venkatramaya, former Chief Justice of India, Justice Venkatacharya, again, former Chief Justice of India, uh, Justice Mohan, uh, several of them, Justice Rajendra Babu. A lot of them came and taught us their area of expertise. But we also had practitioners. So we had uh, uh, senior advocates like Nariman K.K. Benugopal, uh, Ram Jitlani. In fact, the trial work that I understand and I have used briefly, most of that knowledge comes from the lectures of uh, of uh, uh, Ramjit Lani. And his way of teaching was not to do section by section. It was to take a case. So he did uh, the Bhawal Sanyasi case. He did the Nanavati case. And he did the Indira Gandhi assassination case. So these were the three cases he picked. And we did all of evidence and CRPC using those cases. And to me, that is really the only knowledge of evidence law and CRPC that I have. And I remember. Unfortunately, for reasons that are attributable to both sides, uh, this has not continued. And when I have uh, been teaching and I speak to professors and law schools, I often tell them that you believe that you are the saints because you have this great academic uh, outlook and uh, you are not uh, really into practice and therefore you can remain disconnected from the real world. And you think of yourself as saints. I have no complaint with that. I also have no complaint with the fact that you think of us as sinners using our knowledge to earn money. I have no complaint with that as well. The only question I have asked of them is, isn't it the duty of the saints to redeem the sinners? In which case, shouldn't you be inviting us more to the law schools and understand that our knowledge for no money can also be distributed free? Uh, I have not had a good answer from them. Uh, as a personal point, I have never refused any invitation to any place to give a lecture. Uh, and I've been to quite a few places in India that uh, most people may not even remember exist. So uh, you know, before somebody says, what have you done? I confess that uh, I have been to most of the national law universities around the country and to many others, uh, law colleges, uh, non-law colleges to do this. Exam. But uh, I will leave you with this final thought that it's not all dark. We have a great op opportunity for redeeming ourselves and reclaiming our place in society. We can only do that if we celebrate our champions and role models. I think as a community, we don't do enough of that. 
if you see the other professions there is a lot of celebration of the good work that uh, they do so if you look at chartered accountants company secretaries doctors uh, you know they have not if you forget uh, the movie business kind of uh, award ceremonies which i am not a fan of but there is a lot of discussion celebration acknowledgement of role models and champions i feel that we are somewhat uh, too modest about the work that we do and if we look closely we will find several champions amongst ourselves and if we celebrate them they will become role models those ideas those principles that they stand for and we celebrate will therefore become more popular i'll stop here and i'll happy to take questions thank you thank you sir uh, amena uh, before we uh, go to the uh, open forum may i request just as ram kumar sir for your comments thank you sir very excellent and insightful articulation with an ethical touch in fact most of our insecurity I, if i believe is attributable to the to the in inferiority in the exposure to updated legal knowledge i don't use the word ignorance of the judges <laughs> but, but i have myself found to be much ignorant when when very expert lawyers come and argue cases over which they have great expertise i have been blaming myself for not achieving that expertise in that field this is a great uh, um, what should i say a handicap for judges the judges uh, um, especially of the constitutional courts they also require training uh, i don't think they they do receive any training in the in the uh, national uh, judicial academy <laughs> except except a, a, a sort of uh, vacation that's not the type of uh, training they should receive even from the from the um, the the elementary elementary i i mean the practical knowledge of law the applied law see the theoretical knowledge you you get from the right from the law college but that is not the uh, the type of uh, training a judge should receive applied law very often the, the training should be to uh, practical questions or practical problems put practical problems and let them apply the law to those problems that is how we resolve disputes but unfortunately that is not the type of training in fact when i addressed a, a newly selected uh, session judges from various uh, states in the national judicial academy um, all of them uh, in fact i was putting problems real problems and asking them to apply the law after the lecture after the lecture all of them came running to me and said sir this is the type of training we we require and you i told him you tell tell it was i think Uh, Mr. Mohan Gopal, or who yes. was he? Yes. 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 Yes.
for uh, as to uh, the prospects of an SLP. When I um, gave him the judgment and uh, discussed a few facts, he said, "Your remedy is a review." I said, "Review will be dismissed. <laughs> All of us know the natural; it will die a natural death." No, you you give you that is your remedy. And I said, "You kindly give me a written opinion." Oh, you collected in the evening. I we, I collected the written opinion as expected. The review was filed and it was dismissed also. Then then next time we again that judgment also we had to move the Supreme Court. So we um, changed the lawyer. We we consulted uh, on K K Venugopal, senior advocate K K Venugopal, yes. and. Uh, we prepared the slp slp was prepared and very uh, and when the case came up for hearing for admission hearing the counsel who appeared for the opposite party was the same counsel who gave us a written opinion <laughs> yes, I, 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 in the evening after the <laughs> hearing was over the, our slp was admitted not understanding his uh, remonstrance <laughs> and the, in the evening i when i discussed with mr venugopal he said See, we we cases are won or lost on their own merits. Let us not sidetrack the issue. That was the advice he gave me. But I was still not satisfied because my senior uh, PCB Menon, I have seen his my senior refusing a brief for the reason that he had already looked into the files of the opposite party and had given an oral opinion. Yes. Oral opinion, not even written opinion. He had he had told me. I asked him, sir, why did you refuse that file? No, I had already seen the uh, because he, I know the weaknesses of the opposite party and the part and the the party of the uh, same party also. So with uh, with that prejudice only, I will be conducting the case. So I don't want if that is the the nature of uh, ethics to be followed by a lawyer. Where are where are we? I uh, I will say only one thing to you yes. that. Uh, these are the examples that we need to discuss i'm not saying we should name and shame lawyers and that is why i said let us celebrate those who are doing well and so they will become the role models now uh, this is this is also uh, when i speak to younger lawyers or i train younger lawyers uh, or i do some leadership training as well i tell them that it's like a game of cricket you know there is a bowler who's bowling wide ball after wide ball after wide ball you don't tell him don't bowl a wide that is quite useless you tell him aim for the stumps there is a better chance that he will hit the stumps the next time saying don't bowl a wide is not good advice so yes. if we apply that to this saying that don't be like that lawyer who is acting for both sides who is in who's kind of behaving in these what we in the in england we call them sharp practices yes. let us not get into any of those now that is a very difficult thing for people to understand because they don't know what to do you're telling them what not to do Thank my you. suggestion would be to hold up these good examples and say look at how so and so counsel was in court look at how these are good pleadings that have been filed in this case look at how submissions have been made fairly by a lawyer before a judge we don't take enough time as seniors and as a community when we observe these things it is happening every day i'm sure there are enough good lawyers engaging in ethical practices in court but we don't notice them we don't honor them for it we don't talk about it it is better because we like gossip and gossip is always negative to talk about all the wrong things that other people are doing it is not gossipy to say look at it it's a wonderful argument look at it it's a fair submission you know here is a government counsel confessing that uh, procedure was not followed in the issue of the geo or the notification he admits it why don't we acknowledge that rather than say he lost the case we want to acknowledge it and the example i often give is even the much maligned niren day as uh, attorney general i would recommend all of you to think of what he did in the bangalore high court in the karnataka high court in bangalore 
when the matter of the uh, arrest and detention of atal bihari vajpayee and others came up they were in bangalore and they were detained in bangalore now before it all went to adm jabalpur and to the supreme court this had happened in bangalore he flew down from delhi told the judge honestly that this order that was passed was not done in accordance with procedure he did not argue there no 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 procedure is a handmaiden of justice this that none of that he stood up and said very clearly i have no defense if you want to hold that procedure is not followed i am willing to say procedure was not followed as a consequence of that statement atal bihari bajpai got on a plane and got admitted to hospital in delhi which could not have happened without that statement so we all remember niren day for what he did in adm jabalpur what we need to be also remembering and i hold no brief for the man i am not related to him but what we have to recognize is that there are examples of those who have stood up and i say specifically on the government side because there is a lot of pressure uh, and there are consequences which perhaps private clients uh, cannot deliver on to lawyers but there is a huge requirement and i go back to pre independence and i am not familiar with the bar in kerala but in bombay the advocate general was an indian he was not a white man for the longest time the longest serving advocate general of the state of bombay was jamshed ji kanga a, a legend and jamshed ji kanga has written to the governor general who was the final authority on legislation several times to say he does not approve of certain provisions and it was a requirement at that time an office procedure for everything to be approved by the advocate general just imagine this is the british government asking an indian advocate general whether the orders they were issuing the legislations they were proposing the subordinate legislation that they were bringing to uh, the floor of the legislature were valid or not were fair or not and here is an advocate general who served at the pleasure of the governor general stating very clearly that these are the following provisions that i don't think are fair these are the reasons why they are not and the government taking it on board there has never been where the advocate general has given his opinion and the governor general has gone against it now if it can be done in british times that you have an advocate general standing up for what is right and whether the government did it maliciously or uh, mischievously or uh, ignorantly i leave it to you we will not talk about it but the governor general wanted to do something he had a law department he had actually a legislative member he had a law member in the legislature and yet this was the power of the advocate general there would never be a case which the advocate general would prosecute if he didn't think it had a fair chance of success it didn't matter whether the cost was in revenue terms oh it's a big matter 1000 crores let us go to court this never happened and if you and the history of that is if you look at all those properties that are in this city all of those were grants from government they could all have been challenged in some form or another yes. look at tax matters jamshed ji kanga was one of the legends of income tax even yes. after this uh, the book exactly but he was a legend of income tax before the book was written and in fact it was written by nani palkhewala and uh, kanga admits that he did nothing to it apart from having a few conversations uh, but in several matters when sir jamshed ji was engaged by the revenue he has made a fair statement of law and you can see it in the law reports that even though he was appearing for the revenue his statement of the law still continues in several sections of the income tax act those cases are still the leading cases in section 9 for example is an easy one those are the leading cases from that time so it is possible for us to find these examples i think we don't 
talk about these examples we don't motivate people our own people with these great examples and role models instead we think that it is easier to find what someone has done wrong and ridicule them maybe be little them with good reason they have deserved it but it would be better if we celebrated and said we have a great tradition we are now the holders of that tradition we can keep the tradition alive and amongst us there is enough of us doing the right thing for us to celebrate one other point i'll make on training uh, recently the uh, parliamentary standing committee on science and technology has uh, scrutinized the dna evidence bill sadly no lawyer has written to the committee to say it is a very bad bill this is a chance which is going to affect all of us yes. not your clients it's going to affect you it's going to affect me it's going to affect our families they want to make a dna database for the whole country without consent they have introduced a concept of suspect privacy, privacy. Mm-hmm. no 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 suspect who is a suspect where in the crpc is the word suspect defined but they have created a word that anybody who is a suspect and anybody's dna which is found in a crime scene now which is a crime scene your chair is a crime scene every location is a crime scene some crime is always com- committed there so effectively you will have a national database of dna of all of our dna and once you have mine you have my sons you have my mothers you have my late father his brothers all can be traced from my dna it is a matter of crpc i'm i'm not talking about constitutional law and privacy but a lot of us lawyers are dealing with crpc but how many have taken the effort to read the legislation to make just write an email to the chairman of the standing committee and say please don't do these things how many bar association the criminal bar in each of these places has written to him to say this does not make any sense you cannot force people to give consent look at the consequence of forcing consent saying you can be just caught up and say there is some crime that has happened somewhere we suspect you give us your dna any this is what it's the bill is and it has been passed by the standing committee it is now going to come before the legislature but here is an opportunity for judges to have been trained about dna we think dna means guilty it is not we have hundreds of cases from all over the world especially the united states where uh, it's called the yeah it just the process is wrong and especially in india with a lack of infrastructure with a lack of training the big challenge is that judges believe that once you have dna he is guilty we have several judgments of the high courts obviously of the lower courts and then of the high courts which just say we have found dna therefore guilty when actually there is none of it there is absolute no chance for several of those cases where the persons have just been found caught their dna has been taken and then been presented in court and said we found dna might it be an onlooker it be an onlooker or bystander <laughs> not even that sir because your dna could be from a previous day oh. it could be from the previous month also so you are not even there at the scene of the crime in any timeline close to the crime it could have been that your dna was on somebody else's shirt that person shook his shirt at the scene of the crime and your dna has fallen there you are not even be in the same city at that time these are the threats but judges don't understand it in fact in a long time ago in 96 i wrote a paper which said dna evidence a judge's nightmare i didn't say it was a criminal's nightmare i said it was a judge's nightmare so here is an opportunity for again for us to train judges as you had said in simulations in real life not in theory not like dr menon gave us lectures but to go through some of these examples and say here are cases what would you do as a sessions judge because they are going to be dealing with this what do you do when you have some forensic expert saying it has matched what are the questions you have to ask what are the questions defense counsel have to ask because they don't know we don't have experts forensic experts in the private sector so the only expert you have is the government expert and the government experts seem to have done there are only a few of them so every case involves the same government experts it is virtually impossible for him to have actually tested all those samples we have one in bombay who has said he has done 500 in the last one year which means he has done one more than one every day 
and he has been in court as well so where is the time to do any of this where is the time to be sure what methods have been adopted so none of this when you said ignorance and expertise here is where training by experts becomes a huge value to <coughs> it is i am not whether somebody should be guilty or innocent i am not on that issue at all but being equipped to know who is guilty and who is not when yeah. dna is relevant and when it is not the dna is not proof of guilt unfortunately we have gone to that proposition there are several high court decisions which basically once one one side says dna the other side just has to sit down so training in these kind of areas uh, i think will be valuable to the bar and the bench i don't know how we will do it but uh, you know people have to be i think a little humble to admit their ignorance and then we can start with uh, you know uh, solving that problem in kerala also we had an advocate general Uh, my name is Surya Narayan Iyer, who who had called, who it seems had called the chief secretary to tell him, don't expect the advocate general to defend all your illegal orders. To rectify yourself, don't expect the high court also to. <laughs> That's a guts. That is the type of guts uh, we had. They had, but uh, now no, is, nowadays, you can ask. Nowadays, that's many of them are political refugees. <laughs> no, uh, see, uh, I think uh, the uh, advocate general or the attorney general cannot be a government pleader uh, or a government pleaser. So we have to now realize that uh, you are the attorney general for India. You are not the attorney general Correct. of India. So you know, the I have said it for many years now. We have not had an ad- attorney general for India. Mostly, he has been against India. So you know, we have had people arguing that there is no fundamental right to privacy. Uh, it doesn't behove an attorney general to say such things. Uh, that is not definitely for India. So uh, I think that is where we have a chance for some advocates general or some uh, attorneys general to stand up and say, "Listen, uh, this is my position." Uh, they will earn respect of the bar. They will earn respect. They are the leaders of the bar, mm-hmm. and if they don't, then they are not holding up the tradition that we had. I mean, again, I go back. The Bombay Bar is a great tradition of the advocate general being fiercely independent. and the whole bar being led by that person even against the chief justice and we've had great success where the judges or the chief justices have not behaved uh, in proper decorum uh, where the advocate general has to just go and have a quiet word with the chief justice and there is a quick reprimand from the chief justice to the erring judge uh, so there is a very powerful position yes, yes. whether we utilize it whether we pick people who are real leaders of the bar to those positions and whether we accept them so the government may notify somebody as the advocate general but if the bar doesn't accept him or her <laughs> as the leader of the bar yes then and the bench doesn't then it sends a very clear message to the government that you may nominate whoever you want but they don't have the respect of the bar and then the government will also realize that it cannot get its work done if it has such a person as the advocate general so it is a duty on the rest of us to keep the government and preserve the culture of the bar and say the bar is led by the advocate general we want a true leader to be the advocate general and we will create a system where uh, only the true leaders of the bar become the advocate general or the attorney general and the government cannot ignore us the government just cannot ignore us because we are involved in the uh, justice delivery system and what the bar feels the bench also feels it may be constrained in being able to say it but uh, you know i'm sure there are uh, ways of uh, indicating their thought on it and the government will then have to yield and say yes so and so person is definitely not the leader of the bar the bar doesn't consider him a leader the bench will not consider him a leader and therefore let us pick somebody who has credibility in our own interest so it is possible to do it and it has happened Uh, we've had several cases as i say i can speak for the bombay bar we had several cases where government has considered somebody as the advocate general has taken good advice from others in the bar and has been told listen this will not work we will not accept him i wish more bars stood up for themselves not for anybody else not for the client stood up for themselves to say do we want to be seen as being led by this man or this lady then it will happen so uh, it's possible for advocates general to be good advocates general to do what the constitution requires them to do and for us to encourage them to do it again we have to support the good 
good people right the good leaders thank you thank you sir thank you justice ram kumar sir justice ramachan sir a really a really a different uh, approach of comparing the ethical system that is being followed in uk and in india see normally we used to say there is no estoppel for a lawyer on a legal provision provision or legal yes. position because he is always yes. find out some method by which the he can distinguish the earlier position and argue for a different position also that is a yes. way in which indian indian uh, this thing comes but ultimately i find that normally in old the old generation of lawyers used to say these are all decisions available against me but i distinguish those decisions on fact so yes. everything will be brought to the notice of the court that this is a real legal position but he want to propose a different type of legal position which he which a court may accept or may not accept correct that is the way in which the older generation were doing it but now even the real decisions are being suppressed and sometimes overruled decisions are being cited <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> cited and unfortunately as justice ram kumar has said because of the pressure on judicial work the judge may not be knowing about the change in the law also is that normally i used to say we used to say when good lawyers argue cases before the court the judge also equipped to give a good judgment yes yes that is yes. always that is the contribution yes. that the lawyer Reflection. community can give Reflection. for the purpose of development of law in all sphere that is a mirror effect <laughs> <laughs> another thing you have said see the regarding the political ethics of this etc see in the arbitration case the, i think the supreme court has said in one of the cases that a, a, a judge who gave an opinion in a particular issue in respect of some company or something like that yes 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 after his retirement there after he was appointed as an arbitrator the other party said that since you already open up your mind by giving an opinion there will be Correct. a possibility of bias, bias. So you should not yes. arbit uh, act as an arbitrator and the supreme court deferred with that and say that it is only a professional opinion that has been given he may give Correct. a real that doesn't mean that the judge uh, he, as a judge he can have the same opinion <laughs> so that is the way in which the things are being also interpreted when it comes to the judicial judicial interpretation of such judicial bias also that that depends upon as you have said the concept but in which we have accepted the ethics is different from the way in which it is being practiced in india that 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 attitude must change as uh, the uh, ram kumar has said that the lawyer must say that once you are either way even for a casual consultation if some matter has come before him and just has opened his mind on that aspect then he is not expected to take up that case whatever be the benefit he is going to get on account of that that okay. must be the attitude that must be the the what is the leadership capacity that the old the senior lawyers must show which the sure. younger generation will follow that will yes. give because we are learning everything from the older generation yes yes so we cannot now the the younger generations the difficulty is that there is no such leaders available no role model role models available now and uh, the difficulty is also that and also i used to say whenever the lawyer, i met a lawyer friends that why do you have association on political basis that is a curse as far as india is concerned that you are go, you are having lawyers association on with political affiliation which in fact bars them or yes. it is an obstacle for them to raise their independent opinion about a particular issue when government issues comes these are all the areas where we differ so that system will have to go maybe see every lawyer may have a independent political ideology that is a different but that should not reflect in his professional career even the bar associations are also being now being led by that yes the yes. councils yes. are also being led by that then in that yes. be the case how will you expect that the judicial the, the professional ethics or professional discipline will be maintained when such complaints comes about a or b then you will be seeing the color of the person which belong which group he belongs to then you are taking a decision as to how this will have to be decided this is how what things are, going on what about public service police all are politicized Yes. everywhere everywhere the whole difficulty is associations are coming in everywhere 
and they decide on the basis of which which color they are holding and whom they will have to support on the basis of the ideology that they are carrying so that affects the entire system so the, there must be some system as cow at at least certain areas where such a type of association should not be there that is my view that how far the lawyer community will accept that is a different question but this is a area where it will obstruct your uh, independent thinking of advocacy as such you will be you, you will be carried away by the policy decisions of the political party which you are to which you are a party you are you are a member now that is how things goes so then that is how the advocate general as you have said advocate general when comes automatically he is a he is coming from a particular uh, the political ideology he reflects that ideology when it uh, the, when the policy is being taken by a particular government in olden days the advocate generals were not being appointed with yes, some yes. political color correct so that 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 plays a great role in protecting the independence of uh, judiciary and independence of decision making by a person to whom you are coming for an advice uh, can i just say this that uh, one of the points i wanted to make and i thought i'll make later is when you think of yourself as a noble profession it is not mere words the connotation is that you are nobler than society you are now saying we are part of society we are the same as society then you are not noble you are noble if you are held to a higher standard and you yourself accept that higher standard and behave to that higher standard. so in sanskrit it's arya putra you call if arya you, no if you say arya that will be um, interpreted in a different no no way. i i don't mean it in the, in the <laughs> that is why i said sanskrit i didn't say german uh, <laughs> so there it is a term of respect of a noble person and nobility is earned now this is not just a statement if you think about which are the professions where privilege is granted there are in the in the west there were only three in india there are only two in the west it was the priest for confession yes. that is privileged discussion whatever is confessed to the priest in confession cannot be uh, revealed the doctor and the lawyer right. so it is not just that we are giving ourselves the title of noble profession it is recognized in the law now we have said noble profession we have recognized it in the law how many of us went to Hello. court or, or said anything when lawyers offices were raided recently we've had three or four cases where lawyers offices have been raided where are the bar associations standing up and saying there is a big issue of privilege let us be clear what is being seized and what is being seized is not privileged communication there is a distinction to be drawn at the time of the raid between what is privileged and what is not what is privileged is absolute you cannot touch it what is not privileged you can seize if you like where are the bar associations now we can keep saying noble 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 but what are we doing to protect our nobility we have to behave like we are noble and protect those who are attacking it we have done neither so again we have to do more as a profession to say we deserve to be a noble profession we are holding ourselves to a higher ethical standard and we will defend against all those who are attacking that higher ethical standard and protect what in the law is really ours because we are a noble profession so yes we can talk about ethics in a very uh, nebulous conceptual way uh, in terms of ideology philosophy all of that but we have instant cases before us now where these questions are being asked and we are not responding to it so uh, i am more concerned about responses to real life situations as you had said earlier uh, than academic hypothetical Abstract. positions yes. not only that sir things are happening because when the cpc was amended it was circulated yes. among the bar associations never yes. send any objection to the provisions yes yes when it has been passed they were taken aback yeah. certain things are uh, they, they, they again are possible not possible for them to follow because one is restriction regarding amendment restriction yes. regarding the pleadings time yes. limit for pleading etc uh, then immediately they started uh, uh, agitation fortunately no estoppel 
<laughs> no sir everybody has sought adjournment so there is no stoppel <laughs> so that is how things are because wherever they require to raise their legal knowledge to be imported for the purpose of society's interest that is not being done that is a whole difficulty because they think that let the law come at that time we will see and courts ah. are also sometimes liberally interpreting even the stricter uh, stricter rules sometimes they say it is mandatory or man uh, directory depending upon the uh, the circumstances which prevails at that time that correct, is correct. <laughs> so it is true uh, yeah. and even those uh, the example is the ncnt has association, some of the provisions have been said to be directory though the legislature wanted to curtail certain things yes. to be done for the purpose of speedy justice This Correct. Uh, we have it. We have it now with the IBC, where it says that the insolvency uh, proceedings have to conclude in 180 days. We have cases who are over 500 days. There is one which is coming to 1,000 days. More so, honor in their breach than observance. <laughs> <laughs> Again, see the uh, one. Even pleading, can... it, see in all those cases, pleading is not completed within the timeline that is in provided. There is whole difficulty in most of the cases because I am also uh, heading the green bench here. the green bench the, the rule says that you will have to complete the pleading within one month from the date of service with a rider court has got the power to extend one more month oh. but unfortunately in none of the cases even the government departments who are responsible for passing such enactment were not filing their requisite statements before that time no i agree with you in fact uh, in the early days in the 90s when the authority for advance rulings was set up under the income tax act where foreign Uh, entities could seek an advance ruling on tax uh justice s rangnathan was the first uh, chairman of the authority for advance rulings and he was very efficient uh, as soon as you applicant filed he would give the department no time within 6 months it would get done subsequently what happened the authority for advance rulings became lax now the law says that it should be done within 6 months now when you apply for an advance ruling the office asks you to sign the letter saying that you waive that provision period period of, <laughs> period of even before you apply so it's like an office objection that if you do not give me a waiver i will not accept your application <laughs> this is these are retired judges of the supreme court who are uh, the chairman of the authority for advance rulings and you they think the whole purpose of this was to get a quick answer on a on a set of facts on a provision of law the law was intended for this particular instance but if you make it like any other assessment proceeding then why do we need you you have created this whole infrastructure for what for ta da and staying in delhi nothing else no because it is not doing any better than an assessment so these are questions where the bar can stand up and say no we will not accept some of these Uh, whatever the clients may say as the bar we will not uh, give waivers we will bring it to the notice of chief justice maybe he doesn't know and say that listen this is what uh, is being routinely done by the registry uh, and it's unacceptable it defeats the whole purpose of this so even the amicus it, it can be also, even the amicus curiae interveners also nowadays they 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 are not projecting the real issue or they are they are not projecting they argue the what is the correct position Or correct. what would be the correct position? But that correct. take up a take up a particular uh, particular side. side and argue for that. There is a whole difficulty now. And, and court is why... not getting court is not getting any input from those people as to whether what would be the different attitude on which it can be seen. Uh, that is why I wanted to highlight what the position of Amicus in the uh, U.S. is, and how it is being dealt with in India. I mean, you are all aware of how it is dealt with in India. i wanted to show how amicus behaves in the us and in the briefs they file they are focusing on this that you know the the dispute relates to only this aspect but the fallout of that dispute you know maybe nuclear for the rest of us and the amicus focuses on that that just don't think of it as you know excess to pay money to y the consequence of the law you're going to lay down on this has Not all that. these other ramifications no 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 even the law also suppose you commit a wrong Yes. it is against the law, against the legal provision but the consequences will have to follow because yeah. merely because it will have a, a, a ramification um, implication on the loss for the government etc no that, no not I that i don't think that i don't think that that will be if that, that such an attitude is taken the courts may not be able to decide 
whether whether the procedure that has been followed is legal or not legal once it is goes to the root of the uh, procedure itself you know option but to set aside the particular contract or something like that no, no i didn't mean it in that way i meant as in the proposition of law that you are going to lay down has to be clear and sharp so that it does not have unintended consequences and like the case i gave of sahara where uh, yes he deserved all the things that the supreme court did to him but in, while laying down the law they oh, laid it out so, so broadly that uh, they didn't realize the damage it was doing to the software business where you know many younger people who would have got esops now are in difficulty now the company cannot do anything the uh, poor employees who have earned these esops they are not free they have been earned what happens to them can they cash them can they list them in the us do they have to sell it is it worthless look at all the consequences mm. of simply Legal. saying that ha huh, that is all i'm saying i'm not saying don't uh, the, the cost to revenue or the cost to government is not what i'm looking at i'm saying when the proposition of law is laid down under which these decisions are taken because after all the supreme court and the high courts lay down the law so when they're consciously resolving disputes they have to contemplate what the law they are laying down and what the consequences of that are and in many cases there are too many unintended consequences that is where amicus comes in and says you are resolving this dispute but keep it narrow because if you go one step further this is the consequence if you go two steps further this is the consequence do you really intend to go that far without considering all of these opportunities and that's why i gave the case of uh, novartis where it has happened with the help of amicus well done it did not happen in 2g we are facing the consequences of billions of dollars of bilateral investment treaty arbitrations uh, which we all knew was going to happen but uh, the supreme court was in a rush to do it didn't take help from the others who were talking about it reading about it writing about it but were not present in court so here is two different aspects of uh, the same problem and how in one case it was done well in the other case we just ignored it Uh, so that was what i meant i didn't mean as in consequence to revenue or not to strike down an order but to say that if you strike down an order these are the consequences if you if you just do it to a contract it may be okay but if you then go off and say every contract with similar clauses this is the problem then somebody has to stop you and say listen there are 10000 of these contracts tomorrow you are not going to get electricity as a result of it if you strike them all down so we need to be more practical and pragmatic about how we do it so we can strike it down contract by contract but don't make this statement which says such and such provision is illegal and unconstitutional such and such provision can never have be present in a contract because the government didn't have authority for such a provision that means that tomorrow you will not have electricity somebody needs to tell the ngt or whoever it is similar things which sadly is not happening so that is where the amicus comes in not because he's taking sides with the uh, applicant petitioner or the government or some third parties who are interested in it but to bring out this and say this is the law these are the consequences and that is why i, I, have, to I have a small doubt on amicus now yes, an sir. amicus query instead of uh, helping the court in in interpreting a particular legal provision has he got a role in making a uh, field study go to the field like an advocate commission <laughs> Uh, it it has happened sir uh, in fact it is uh, happening in india india yes, it is happening so in yes. foreign jurisdictions do the amicus curi go make a field survey yes they do so uh, to explain the consequences of these actions okay. uh, in the briefs that are submitted they are legal briefs but they rely on statistics economics actual facts so for example if you take the aadhar case the court just did not look at the damage aadhar was doing it just refused to look at it it relied on this powerpoint presentation by the uh, ceo of uada it says it is very secure nothing can go wrong it refused to look at actually there were so many people who are not getting rations there so many people who are excluded from provision of services when they heard the matter relating to linking with income tax they knew that it was a fraud that by linking pan to aadhar you are going to achieve nothing in fact you are going to validate a whole lot of new pans and create more scams because aadhar has no basis you are creating new identity so you know uh, hanuman ji can have aadhar monkeys can have aadhar donkeys can have aadhar trees can have aadhar so you are creating these new class 
of fake accounts which are being rationalized and legitimized thanks to the linking which earlier you could not have done but uh, the courts didn't get a chance to understand this to spend time on it and that is where apart from the petitioners having independent amicus curiae would have helped to say we hear what the government is saying we are not saying the government is doing wrong but here are the big risks and even if it happens to 1% in our country 1% is 1 crore people yes <laughs> it, it, it's not like some small country where you know it is a few hundred people or a few thousand people for us it's 1 crore people and therefore to say it is not a matter of tens or hundreds it is a matter of crores and now we are seeing the consequences of it so those are the places where the amicus actually comes in the amicus itself may not uh, himself or herself may not do the research but will rely on expert reports to say please understand the industry please understand the system please understand what the risks are and having understood the system having understood the science in some cases having understood the statistics in some cases the economics in some cases this is the consequence and therefore we have to be able to understand and visualize what are the consequences and then look at what is desirable what can be mitigated how do we narrow it rather than just striking it down should we strike it down and say no for now we can't do it let us wait until we have better technology let us wait until the system stabilizes don't include it for all of the country so rather than make it mandatory for everyone which is what it has become now you first run it, uh, you first run it correct you first run it for cghs you run a national identity system for cghs you run a national identity system for railways employees you run a national identity system for armed forces let us see how it works you do that let us get it to a scale where it's 50 lakhs if you include these three groups it will include that many people then you come back to us then we will see whether it should be tagged with other things or not give us time so that we understand before we get to 150 crores what the problems are because once you have a problem it multiplies into 150 crores so let us contain it let us see how it works and then go off and do it so the supreme court would have had all of these insights to say we will not allow government to have aadhar for everyone and do it in this way please do it in some select districts let's pick one district per state do it properly let us wait for 2 3 years let us see what happens let us see what the problems are come back and do a report so that could have happened just like they have done in pollution matters they have done in several other matters where matter keeps coming back every year a year after year to say how much progress we have made so that is the good role for amicus to have if if courts encourage it uh, then there will be a place for uh, lawyers to be doing this so it has to be both the judges also must want it lawyers must be willing to volunteer to be amicus both are uh, you mm-hmm. know uh, necessary well thank you Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Ramesh. Oh, sorry, Ramesh, sir. Sorry, thank you very much, man. Regarding yes. the other thing, also the people are afraid of foreign foreign investment. That is foreign, uh, the imported lawyers from foreign. Probably because <laughs> they are afraid of they are uh, as uh, brother Ram Kumar has said, afraid of their inferiority complex that they may not be able to face the uh, standard mm-hmm. that they are maintaining on legal aspects. Put it bluntly, ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, unfortunately because you know you have a confidence because you have got a better com- uh, competent competency you will have you can raise your uh, level of uh, uh, knowledge also that that must be the attitude uh, whether whether is a healthy competition is there always there will be better for uh, the better quality of service that is being rendered also same thing can be applicable when legal professions also nothing wrong in persons coming suppose a lawyer from bombay comes and argue in kerala high court that doesn't mean the kerala high court the lawyers are uh, losing their brief okay. just like that only people are coming from there this is this is the choice of the party who wants to engage who that's all no and uh, you look at the reality of it uh, the bar councils have been agitating against foreign lawyers petitions have been filed you know you are fearing the impossible you are so not thing is that, no, have... and there, there one thing can be can can like because in us if you go as indian lawyer course i think that they cannot uh, enhance the scope of argument it appears they can no no, no but, nothing 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 i i have uh, practiced some countries some countries i think there is some because they cannot go in constitutionality of a particular position cannot be challenged by an outside lawyer only the person who are appearing there can do it that's i so? read somewhere so? i don't know yes, no 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 there is no, 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 no. 
no 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 some so uh, i do not know whether no, it no. is right or not because some article i have read some somewhere so i have uh, been admitted to practice uh, in the in england and wales uh, and there was no restriction on me appearing in court there was no restriction on me filing pleadings none of those things so uh, at least as far as europe is concerned it has never been an issue in the united states there are two different paths you can you only have to register as a foreign practitioner you don't have to do anything more and i was registered as a foreign practitioner in more than one bar because each state has its own bar just like we have in india you can register you can appear there is no problem with that as well so the question of whether millions of foreign people are coming to the united states and taking away the jobs of us lawyers has not happened it has not happened in europe as well in all of the european bars you can appear so the fear that we have in india that all these foreign lawyers who are in europe and in the us will give up their practices and all land up in ernakulam <laughs> you know somebody needs to sit them down and say you know is this a rational off, fear knock off the worker look <laughs> ah, ah is, is it a rational fear has it happened anywhere in the world ever before the rest of the world has been open for 30 years or so as i said at least in europe my experiences since the 90s americans have been there germans have been there french have been there they have all mixed everything is working fine none of this has happened in each of the local bars the locals are the ones who continue to uh, be dominant no, no, not even that, in the no, not only that i think even a foreign firm comes they will take the, the assistance of the local bar to find out what of is course. the uh, position of course they will get the brief from them there yes. after they may uh, evaluate well, legal question how it will be argued etc that is the only thing possible normally no, just like not a, even just like a advocate on record going and instructing the senior counsel uh, and then senior counsel arguing the case let me no, i'll take a slightly different example uh, and i will you know uh, justice umajulu will forgive me for this uh, i am admitted to practice in india i could have filed uh, the case in vizag myself uh, i was practicing in london but i came to uh, justice somya julu and said you are the expert on this matter in the district court in vizag i didn't even file an appearance in that matter justice somya julu will confirm that i didn't even file an appearance in that matter so that is what is likely to happen that if i have a matter involving a foreign client in india and it is in the district court in vizag i am not even talking about the big cities what is the approach the foreign firms have taken they find the best lawyer there to argue the matter now what is the other possibility that they find some law firm in delhi or bombay who they know because they have done some other transactions and that law firm finds justice sumer julu uh, chambers in uh, vizag but the work will still remain in vizag will be done by the vizag bar now it is unlikely that they will fly a qc from chambers in london to appear before a district judge in vizag is that likely so the fear amongst i think the bar about this invasion of the white man taking away yes. our livelihood is completely yes, unfounded yes. probably they think completely that they, unfounded. It, it may come as an earlier east india company take over india <laughs> ah, but that was opium slightly different thing ha huh? we are talking about opium there we are talking about the bar here uh, i think there is a big difference <laughs> yes questions yes sir yes. uh, please sir uh, what to say excellent presentation and a different approach and excellent de- deliberation also sir uh, uh, regarding one uh, one information because uh, justice ram kumar was asking a question of uh, Uh, amicus curie is deputing to the field work one of the best examples supreme court itself directed just uh, mr uh, gobal subramaniam senior advocate as a curie to that uh, trivandrum uh, and he has done an excellent work also. yes yes, yes. So that was the one example but there was a direction that you have to be there and uh, on yes, yes, yes. that was the purpose also 
some other cases also the environmental matters also mc like, mehta old uh, case mc mehta and yes, all yes. Uh, they have done skipper construction is another one skipper uh, construction supreme yes, court matter with yeah. the dda flats in delhi where yeah, there exactly. was scandal uh, and i know the amicus there dan krishnan uh, uh, yeah, so many senior now uh, but that <laughs> he was not and he was uh, in that matter is amicus. famous for he was the special prosecutor for nirbhaya case nirbhaya case yes, uh, and again <laughs> pro bono i think several of those cases is not pro bono he was he was police he was he was that time no, no, he was no. delhi high court he was appearing for uh, uh, police but, in delhi yes he court. was he was uh, but in this case he was not appearing he was only appearing for cbi as special prosecutor yeah. earlier in this case he appeared for delhi police as uh, on pro bono basis for nirbhaya uh, and he's uh, and also in the uh, uh, parliament attack case so there are several of those cases where he is appeared. he has and appeared he, in he is basically from uh, neil grease his father is also I know a him well. lawyer uh, very well <laughs> i have he used to be yes yes his father was a uh, his father, his was, father an uh, was a leader of the bar Yeah, leader I, of the Nilgiris Bar. Suddenly, uh, one of my uncle is a junior to him, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Uh, uh, Krishnan. I am telling. And yes, he, yes, we, yes. We lost him. He, we lost him recently, father. Yes, I know. Uh, lost... I was there two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, the uh, one or two aspects. One information, but we are, you were talking. the regarding legislation the participation of legal uh, uh, knowledge persons uh, lawyers and judges in legislation uh, that is lacking so uh, just uh, yes. ramushan was telling that cpc amendment issue that was a classic example later everybody revealed the issue is that the yes. legislators now mps and mlas in india are only part time uh, what do you call it? <laughs> part time in uh, legislation actually because they are having many other work including political party they are leaders of political party so various advocate uh, i think no no various <laughs> issues as a politician they are handling many other issues and only yeah. one uh, one of their respons uh, responsibilities is that uh, legislation so they are not giving much uh, because uh, cps even the cpc amendment and many other important legislations was uh, uh, passed by the parliament without any discussion we we yes. can see that even recently yes. also the agriculture laws you know with there that was uh, yes. the, the, the we, we may have difference of opinion but yes. the yes. main grievance on that uh, the laws we may have the main grievance that it was not discussed in parliament that was the one of yes. the main reasons yes. Uh, uh, yes. for uh, for this uh. so for this purpose see why can't the bar associations and bar council have a permanent body of uh, experts whenever uh, so that uh, there should be some arrangements for that bar association uh, each bar association especially high court and uh, supreme court bar association and bar councils should have a permanent body for monitoring this le legislation uh, giving their uh, their uh, suggestions Inputs. and uh, everything uh, in time in time in time is the most important thing because they, uh, while uh, preparing and also by, by that time the legislation is passed then only way is the agitations and all so one, one uh, that is one aspect second aspect we are privileged communication uh, we are yes, talking about yes. privileged communication is a very uh, very sensitive issue uh, yes. sir uh, see i will just uh, cite an example one of one i come across with an, uh, an issue uh, that is a lawyer uh, after committing a murder a person directly went to the office of the uh, a criminal lawyer and criminal lawyer that is Uh, so he has a, he's got a privilege, but what he did, he sent the accused to, to his police, private yeah. place or farm uh, somewhere for hiding. So that uh, because later that was uh, police was taking it. Police was want to charge him under uh, this one uh, harboring offence. So there was a lot of agitations over that. You are not supposed to. Be, he came only for uh, legal uh, assistance. So see, such situations. There are other in incidents of the raids uh, of office. Uh, you, you are talking. So why can't we have a? Uh, clear, I don't. I don't think even advocates act or uh, other legislations are very clear on this point. What is privileged communication and what is not? So it is high time to uh, have a such legislation and your uh, take on that. One more aspect. One more issue. I am just telling. regarding the lee correct the, the appraising the court with the correct legal, legal position i will just tell you an example and tell you i engaged a senior lawyer in supreme court uh, for a uh, for a matter uh, for he i was uh, i was 
I, I was canvassing a particular position on the purchase certificate. It says a suit on uh, suit, yeah. Uh, yeah. civil suit. And I was I was very much on the uh, we were on the validity of the purchase certificate. Yeah. The and we, the foreknown session before Justice Deepak Mishra when when he was in court too, <laughs> we argued that matter and he succeeded. And then then on there the the two uh, And around two three items later. There was an another suit, another matter, which I was, I have not engaged any other senior, but I was same, I was with the same position, but the learned senior who appeared for me was opposite on my side. And he want to say the, uh, the purchase certificates validity, he want to attack that. What is it? At the, after dictating this order, the learned senior said that I have some difficulty in the afternoon, so this item may be unchanged. <laughs> this matter may be urgent. But he said, no, no, why we, are, we can finish it and all. So the, after coming out from the court, the Leonard Senior told me, the, my difficulty is that I have to argue against the position which I have argued in the morning, almost similar in the morning. Today itself, that is a problem. Fortunately, that matter, though the Deepak Mishra later become senior, he, uh, sorry, Chief Justice, then he retired uh, and, uh, and the next Chief Justice is also going to, thereafter this, that matter is again not listed so far. <laughs> so, so, uh, the... so I'll respond to those three points. Uh, scrutiny by the bar, uh, the Bombay Bar Association, uh, during the colonial times, uh, was very, very active in scrutiny. Again, because the advocate general took the lead on that, he would often solicit from members of the bar their views on these aspects. Now, I'm not talking about remote items, amendments to Arbitration Act, amendments to CPC, even these. But in those days, it used to be taken on specific matters as well. So land, taxation, trade, all of these matters as well. The bar was consulted actively by the governor general. Now, saying well, that one second, today, should, it, should it not percolate down to the trial lawyer who is at the cutting edge? Yes, yes, yes. So but yes, that yes. is that seldom happens. Uh, at that time, view. Uh, sir, at that time, the Bombay Bar Association included trial lawyers because the High Court has uh, original side jurisdiction. Oh, original side, okay. So uh, we have original ah, civil yes. side jurisdiction. Yes, so yes. Not we have. We don't, uh, we don't have it yet. There was a practice of circulating the legislations among the bar associations. Yes. Their views. But that is that is not happening. That now. is a just a ritual. Empty formality. No, that is not now happening, sir. That is not I, earlier. It was at least sent. Now it is not happening yes. at all. Maybe it is not sent because we didn't respond actively. Yeah, that to that. Correct. Both ways, no. Uh, this is yeah, whether the offer was proper, made, proper input. How many sometimes. bar associations submitted uh, their uh, their response to the law, law commissions? Maybe yes. less. I don't know. Correct. So uh, one is scrutiny by the bar. Uh, there was a tradition of it. Now, we don't want to blame why it has not happened, but it's a chance to revive it. So if the individual bars can speak to their governments and the advocate general and say, this is a good tradition, uh, helps with the progress of law, will reduce litigation if we deal with these problems in advance, why don't we do it? So perhaps, again, this is leadership by the advocate general. You know, if the advocate general says, yes, you know, he's a leader. If he doesn't, then you know what the alternate is. Uh, I think on uh, uh, privilege, it's a... Uh, uh, for everybody to watch, there is a series uh, called Rumpole of the Bailey. It was made many, many years ago. Uh, and you may find some videos of it. He deals with what you are talking about, that fact situation, in one of the episodes. So rather than my trying to describe the episode, I would recommend that uh, on privilege, and he's a criminal lawyer in the trial court at the Old Bailey. Uh, the books are wonderful. But they were also converted into a series of videos, uh, TV series. Uh, everybody, I think, uh, of a particular generation will relate to it. And how he has these ethical issues where he tells the, uh, uh, the uh, accused in that case uh, that if you confess to me, I can't take your brief. So it is very clear that, you know, what the ethical line is. So I cannot tell you. To lie, I cannot help you lie. I will stop you from lying. I will tell you what can be done, but I will also tell you what can't be done. And if you tell me something which clearly incriminates you for the crime, 
then I can't defend you because I have to reveal that to the court. So there is a very clear set of principles that are well accepted by the bar there. So you know what you can tell the counsel. And if the counsel knows, he's bound to tell the judge. Now, certainly providing, providing a hiding place for a fugitive. <laughs> <laughs> no, that will not come under the privilege. <laughs> no, no, that part he denies. That's the problem. That part he denies. No, no, see, when I was in Kotayam, I had an occasion that what happened was um, a, a lawyer was acting as a power attorney for a mother, or his mother, in respect of letting out some building. That the crime place of crime was that. Of course, the police questioned him as a witness to say that whether this room has been let yes. out to a particular person because he is a power of an older. And he was made as a witness to prove this fact because place of yes, occurrence yes. is that who is in possession of that area is the question. Yes, yes. Ultimately, he filed vakalat for one of the accused in that case and want to defend that law, the same. Then I told him that but then the public prosecutor has raised a question that is a professional uh, it's, this it's thing for misconduct. It's a misconduct. So he said, <laughs> then he said that no, 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 I can, I can appear because I've been falsely implicated in the case for as a witness no. only for the purpose of avoiding me from appearing for that person. No. And I told him that if you want me to give a judgment on that, you will be in trouble if you yes. want to do it or not. Then he argued the case by himself for that proposition and I have to give a decision ruling on say, it say ruling on that that he is not entitled to do the professional ethics uh, uh, debars him from doing it because he is likely to be put as a witness in the box then he cannot who, who will cross examine him for that person actually, uh, actually according to me you should have referred to bar council so but uh, no subsequently what he withdraws after my uh, judgment he withdraws his uh, akal so if he had pursued that then if he had pursued that i would have uh, referred the matter to the bar association <laughs> No, but uh, the uh, the tragedy is that the no, bar council... The difficulty counsel... is you have been asked as a judge to put in a precarious position against a lawyer who is expected to come for next cases also. That is a difficulty. The lawyers but... are not understanding the mind of the court at that time. Suppose the mind, the mind of the court is that he doesn't want you to argue, uh, appear. That gives a but... good relationship between the bench and the bar also because if magnanimity is... He shows the mechanism between withdrawing it. Whatever be the loss he is having, professional loss he is having on account of this brief, that is a different thing. But he has not done it. But this is, recently, again, I said, it's an issue I of... Lost a good brief huh? because of, uh, in the notice sent by, uh, for section 9, uh, sorry, sec, uh, section 11, uh, my name refers there. <laughs> so, Sham knows. <laughs> He's laughing. So, since only <laughs> my name was just there, I said, I, I won't be doing this <laughs> Because he's my regular kind, what I sent to somebody else. So, no, but I think the issue here is that uh, lawyers don't feel that they have to follow these rules. And the bar council feels that it is okay that lawyers are not following these rules. Uh, something like this would never have occurred to a solicitor or counsel in the UK. If you look at the uh, Solicitor's Gazette, the Law Gazette that comes out, with disciplinary proceedings taken against lawyers, you will find every month one or two. So they're very diligent for anybody who steps even one step across the line or even close to the line, they will be penalized. So the expectation is that there are no exceptions. The expectation is that you will comply completely and you they come down very heavily. So even if there is a small mistake in your pleadings, and there are several examples of that, where judges have reprimanded counsel. And in several of these cases, those opinions of fact were reasonably held. And yet the judges have reprimanded counsel for their statements to say it doesn't matter if it was reasonably held. That is not the standard. The standard is, have you exercised all possible care before you stated the fact? So you see the standard. It is not view reasonably held. It is verified fact. So the, there is no scope to say Beyond any reasonable cause. doubt. Just like, just like no, no doubt. allegation against the advocate commissioner in the objections file. 
prosecution's <laughs> duty beyond reasonable doubt <laughs> beyond any doubt so that is why when the statements are written and submitted to court by the solicitors the burden on us is to be 100% sure if we are not 100% sure we will state there that i believe this to be true but here are the circumstances that you should be aware of that lead me to conclude that i am not 100% sure i i can't give you percentages but here are the surrounding facts for example so and so had a telephone call he constantly said they had a conversation about so and so time on about so and so day i will say there there has been no contemporaneous record of the call or its contents and what was spoken which means all i am saying is that there may have been a call i am saying i have seen the call record of his mobile phone indicating that the call lasted from so and so time to so and so time on so and so day to so and so day but there is nothing to suggest that what he claims he has spoken has been spoken on that call so i am only saying that i have verified that a call took place whether the other side phone was dead or not i don't know but here is the record which i have verified i cannot say that so, so all these things were actually spoken that has to be admitted by the other side i am saying that my client tells me the following and f- from the surrounding facts it seems that it may have happened so what happened before what happened during what happened his behavior before his behavior after all that is recorded so that is the level of accuracy i have to show there to say nothing i say is misleading i am not omitting anything unflinching honesty is required Absolutely. so integrity that's why i go back to this we claim we are a noble profession where is the nobility what is that integrity standard it is this then as a rule when pleadings are filed in court people rely on it because it is 100% guaranteed to be true then the issue gets very narrow because the issue in question in dispute is a very narrow issue which can be dealt with very quickly we don't have to start with no 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 i am not even aware of this document then the other side says no 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 it's a notarized document then you fight over whether the document exists or not whether it is a forgery no we don't have to go into all of that it comes down to a short point no, let's no, argue no, the short point no, that is the standard of legal profession that is being going on in india and uk the difference is that correct that's why i said that it's up to us people don't lie and i say you know in india we say you have your truth i have my truth and then the judge has his truth but uh, <laughs> but in the uh, in in society uh, in the west as well people don't have common lives i'll give you an example uh, i was in my first day at work my secretary was supposed to have come in i reached the office she had not arrived she had left a voicemail message saying uh, it was a monday she said i had a rough night last night i missed my train in the morning i am going to be half an hour late she didn't say my cat died you know the train was late none of those things she honestly called up and said the truth and when she came uh, 20 minutes late she came first to my office and said i'm very sorry this is the truth i didn't even have to ask anything she said uh, i missed my train in the morning because i was waking up late i missed my train in the morning i will work through lunch time and finish your work don't worry about it it didn't even occur to her and uh, it's my i don't know any better right i have come from a different country she could have said anything and i would have believed it i don't know where how trains work i don't know where she lives nothing i know but that is not the culture there and that is spread through in the profession that when i send a letter saying uh, i have issued the check i have actually issued the check there is no doubt about it that the check has been issued here the client will tell you yes 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 i have sent the money have you not got it or some other lawyer will tell the other lawyer no, no i have paid it to court i have filed the wakalat i have filed affidavit nothing has happened so uh, unless we start behaving like a noble profession then and there are many who do uh, the public will not see us as a noble profession so we need to use the same standards for ourselves and say i will hold myself to that standard and we have many examples i think we have seen at least in this discussion that there are several examples of uh, counsel and lawyers uh, being held to a standard and if we celebrate it then the younger people will see them as role models today they only see what is on uh, the blogs uh, bar and bench and live law and what crazy submissions are being made 
ridiculous arguments are being made that's what they see and even the senior counsel makes such ridiculous arguments they think that is how you have to argue in court so we have to show them the alternative and say no 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 you cannot argue like this you know in a matter involving arbitration you can't talk about east india company it is unacceptable you talk about arbitration law uh, whoever you may be you may be a former attorney general but it is irrelevant let us talk about arbitration law so those are the kind of things that if we demonstrate in our practice uh, point it out even if your junior is seeing some other senior arguing point it out and say look here is somebody worth watching and learning from this is a good argument to uh, to watch for court craft for the way fair submissions are being made for the ethical practice uh, then they will see these examples otherwise the focus is on all the other unpleasant stuff that uh, we are talking about so perhaps we should start talking about more and more good stuff uh, which is actually happening but we are somehow a little modest i think to talk about them there's a bit of humility in in talking about good things but there is no shame in gossiping there is the other side of it correct sir so sir, uh, sir. there is a strong possibility that i might have to provide lunch to everybody i think i'll rush <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I just take a uh, uh, one question from. Do we have to Najib. say good night? <laughs> no, yeah. I just like saying. I mean, usually we used to do that. Najib, if you can make it fast, yeah, please. Sir, it was a very enlightening and deep insight to talk. I very much benefited by your uh, thought sharing. So I just want to ask you two questions. My first question yes. was, sir, I am an insolvency professional also who does advocacy. Yes, yes. As you were telling, you know, the two accounts need to be maintained, one for insolvency and another for advocacy. Yes. And my second yes, thing yes. is, my, my second question is regarding this Companies Act. The Companies yes. Act allows advocates also to go for that company and corporation, but in the toolkit of the MCA, that is not allowable as a yes. certificate. Yes. So that. That is yes. creating a problem for us. So yes, yes. What is your take on that, sir? No, and it's also one, exactly one more thing. One more thing. Why that IB said that the Bar Council of India is not getting as an IPA because all the other ICSI, IC, MAI, and uh, ICA are all are all in that insolvency professional agencies, whereas Bar Council is not there. So I need to enroll with either of the other three, not with Bar Council of India. And, and this is exactly the point I was making that you know in all of these aspects, the bar is not making representation as a group, and therefore we are finding this encroachment. What is essentially a legal function, an aspect of justice, being run by the Institute of Chartered Accountant, the Institute of Company Secretaries. This is exactly the issue I was uh, mentioning to you that where is it that the bar is taking leadership in any of these matters? the bar council uh, of india i don't know uh, you know it is involved in such higher matters uh, but there was a time when the bar council of india was really involved in this uh, and advocating for the legal profession so this is a very good example i have said earlier i have written earlier about the companies act and the mca filing to say that why is it that uh, you need a, a chartered accountant or a company secretary but not an advocate who can uh, go and do the filings it's a real issue uh, and it's a nuisance it just creates work for company secretaries to hand out their uh, certification so that uh, to retail it they are like distributing the chance for others to do it so you can hire without actually ever having met that company secretary you can use his credentials for filing so they are kind of a, become a retail system now i have a, a certificate of practice therefore hundreds of people are using my certificate of practice for filing that has already happened so i agree with you on that uh, similarly with the uh, insolvency professionals there is no reason why the bar council itself cannot register and all of us cannot be insolvency professionals if they say you must pass some exam you tell us what that exam is what those qualifications are we will pass those what is the problem with that anyway we are better qualified than the others to do any of this and in fact the difficulties we are having with uh, insolvency professionals and their behavior is that they don't understand how a legal system works so even if you see the recent rico case the uh, the process letter was such that uh, the uh, supreme court had to say that this is an arbitrary process it's an unfair process whereas if a lawyer had handled it a good lawyer had handled it he would have told in advance the coc that listen this process is not possible you cannot expect a waiver under duress there is no waiver so under duress there is no waiver and uh, joining under protest is perfectly valid 
So these aspects of procedure which lawyers understand intuitively and with experience, the company secretary and the CA will not understand. So these are the aspects where we can demonstrate that we are really the people who should be able to do this. And again, you know, people like you should perhaps uh, take a leadership role in saying, at least with the MCA and with the uh, IBC, to say that, listen, you can't exclude lawyers from this process. And the cause of many of your problems is that you've excluded us. Thank you so much. Uh, if you are KVJ Rao, sir, uh, uh, please make it fast, please. Yeah. Sir, firstly, I bow down to all of you all because introspecting the ethics takes a lot of courage. And today, all of you all on the platform, I really need to bow to you to accept certain misfalls of our own of the fraternity. Having said that, I will come directly to a question. I have a person who's filed an affidavit a public servant who has suppressed his uh, FIR from the government service. And I have the former attorney general come and say, but sir, he's protected by 197. Yeah. Lie through the skin of his teeth. What, what do I say to that person? And then when I told him, I said, look, here is your judgment. Yeah. He's saying, he, he said, no, no, but you know, I said, no, you read paragraph one and paragraph 26. That's it. I I'm, don't go through the whole judgment. Lying and suppressing an FIR from the government cannot be part of his official duties. And here, and that man has swindled five crores from Air India. I agree. Uh, and, I think... and, and, I, and I tell him, I said, how can you come and say this? He says, I get paid two lakhs to just come here, stand, say this and go away in two minutes. And I said, thank you very much. So you are admitting you are also looting the system. You're looting the government. And I agree. It, it becomes so difficult, sir. It becomes so difficult that at every step you find this unethical practice. When when you have admitted under affidavit that he has suppressed it, withdraw your petition, punish the man, and just close it. But we are having this litigation is going on for three years. I agree, and this is where I think uh, you know if uh, the bar makes takes a stand and the bench is supportive of it. Uh, it just takes one or two examples. See, in, in your case, if the bench was uh, a little more compassionate to your cause, then it would be an example. Then the next time, somebody would be very scared to do it. The difficulty is we have let off public servants from all responsibility. So, you know, we've got Hussein Ara Khatun, which said you are entitled to compensation and go after the policeman. But how many policemen have ever been convicted for anything that they have done wrong? You are I, now saying that you know you have uh, illegal custody. Where is the policeman who is hauled up for illegal custody? Where are I the had, policemen? Is, yeah, once you stop doing it, once you start doing it, you, it doesn't take very many in each high court. If you do one, I had a magistrate who said that to me last week. He's saying, "Why are you not prosecuting the police?" So I said, "Okay, sir. If that is what you want, I'll do it." So we filed the application. Tomorrow I'll, they'll be hearing the matter on the application. This is far so and few in between, sir. This is far no, and but, few in between. But it takes only one or two. If you see the history of how law has moved on this, it just takes one or two. You may have to file 100 to win that one. But True. in every high court, if you get one successful, then it sends a very strong message True. to the politicians, to the policemen, to the administration that, listen, during the course of this uh, set of judges, it is not going to work. So at least for you know those two, three years, you would have changed their behavior to some extent. And those are the little things we as lawyers can do, is take up these matters and hope for success in one of them. You see, it, it, it is many that were filed that uh, the diesel trucks disappeared from Delhi. Also, there was a personal interest of the judges because they were they couldn't breathe. That's a different point. But it took a lot of environmental litigation to get CNG. But it took a lot. Uh, at the same time, nothing has happened to the Ganga because the judges are not really bathing in the Ganga. Ganga. So we don't know. But if you take up these matters, maybe one in each high court, uh, you know, we may get some hope and that might change. So I am all for uh, trying and we I, I don't have much to lose. Uh, but somebody has to try, and if we hold ourselves up as uh, part of the justice system, then it is, behooves us to at least make, you know, once a year to each lawyer to take one case like this. One case once a year. 
and imagine the change you can do. True. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, what do you bring? Well, sir, that was a wonderful talk and it was so insightful. I just have a small doubt because as you said that uh, this is one of the most noblest of all the professions. So, kindly see, the C designated senior educators, oh, 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 oh. yeah, they dress up like the Queen's Council. <laughs> a coat or a jacket which is ornate by fleets and fineries, which is not permitted under law. And despite the fact that uh, the designated seniors, they are not being the Queen's Council, and the gown of the Queen's Council, so that essentially that differ from the barrister, I mean the barrister's gown or the solicitor's gown. Now you can see our senior educates, they appear to wear such jackets and gown to display or rather show the other educates, the courts as well as the clients, that they have got a seal of superiority which is attached to them by this kind of a different dress. And to be very honest, these designated seniors, they illegally wear this type of uh, short coat or jacket uh, with uh, the uh, double back and uh, the flowing arms. And it means that the sole object is to merely attract the attention of the colleagues and the clients, that they are superiors who are picked out of uh, one and the same class of advocates. So kindly see the Bar Council of India under section 491 yeah. of the Advocates Act of 1961 prescribes a particular dress code yes. for the advocates. Of course, the Advocates Act at section 16 would classify advocate, of course, advocates and senior advocates. But the Bar Council of India, while providing for this particular dress code, it does not differentiate between normal advocates and the designated seniors. And which we see uh, is being contained in uh, part 6 of chapter 4 of the Bar Council of India rules. And the attire which is chosen to be worn by these designated seniors are those which are worn by the Queen's Council. Now kindly see sir, we know that the senior advocates they are differ from the Queen's Council. That is why Harish Salve who was a senior advocate here he went on to become a Queen's Council girl. So it is not one and the same. And the heritage of this British legal profession, that is no longer extant in our country. And India is no more under the colonial empire. So the senior educates, according to me, they have no right to wear the Queen's Council robes in India. Because the Queen or the King, they no longer they rule our country. And our country has attained independence around seven and a half decades back. And we are seeing the pernicious effect of this particular optical distinction in our courtrooms, even in the highest courts. Only the persons who I don't know, only the designated seniors, they get a right of audience when uh, compared to the other junior lawyers. So what is your take on that, sir? So uh, I'll say two things to you. One that uh, in the uh, English bar, uh, we no longer wear robes or uh, wigs. So the Queen's Council in the UK does not appear wearing a wig and gown anymore. So they will appear like I have appeared today and before you. Oh. So, so they have given up on this uh, frightfully uncomfortable, obsolete, attire so even if you and now it's all streamed so please watch the uh, uk supreme court uh, cases a very interesting case happened when the uh, when the government wanted to withdraw from the european union there's a very important constitutional case that happened and please observe the way submissions were made in that case by the attorney general and several other qcs you will find that they are wearing a regular suit which is their normal attire they are not wearing wigs, neither are the judges wearing wigs, neither are the uh, council wearing wigs or the solicitors. Everybody is dressed the same, including the judges. The judges are oh. also wearing suits oh. and ties and uh, lady judges are wearing dresses. There is no distinction between what the judges are wearing, what the Queen's Council are wearing, what the solicitors are wearing, what the junior advocates are wearing. There is oh, no so difference. it is like bar banned drugs being... Right in India. <laughs> <laughs> because what, 
banned drugs correct <laughs> drugs which are banned there are being tried in india <laughs> so uh, they have given up on this uh, they went through a process for the last 20 years of reforming their legal system and saying that listen we have become obsolete our procedures are not understandable by people so they had a huge reform by the master of rolls at that time and uh, as a result of which procedure is written in plain english all the rules are written in plain english they have got rid of these funny clothes that nobody has worn for 200 years in that country uh, they have got rid of all of the strange uh, designations methods of conversation all of that is gone so it is as if you would have a normal conversation with any other person in a formal setting so i would suggest please uh, if you go to the uk supreme court website you can find recordings of leading cases that have happened my recommendation is on a sunday afternoon some of you may be interested in the next few months at least during court vacation on a sunday afternoon please take a look at how pleadings are done how arguments are made and submissions are made similarly you can find in the united states supreme court the difference in the united states supreme court is that the judges wear a black uh, robe but they are all the same counsel wear no robes so it doesn't matter where you come from what you uh, which state you come from whether you're a solicitor general office or you're a private practitioner you go in a regular suit and present yourself before the united states supreme court it is the same in all the american courts the judge will wear a kind of robe does any section enjoy a pre audience uh not in the uh, united kingdom obviously the attorney general will come first but okay. otherwise there is no pre audience uh, it doesn't go by seniority either I so see. so uh, amongst the counsel on one side they will decide who will lead who and who in what order okay. depending on how, their areas of expertise so it doesn't matter that the senior is going to talk about some savings clause in the legislation he goes first that is not how it works so if i am an expert on the operative part and i am the junior most i will still go first and the senior most person will be talking about the savings clause of the agreement of the uh, legislation which comes in the end he will come in the end so the only preeminence is uh, for the attorney general but the attorney general there is a slightly different person from the attorney general here because the attorney general there is a member of cabinet he is a member of parliament and he is present in parliament so again there we have adopted a strange way of what the attorney general can do so in india the attorney general can be heard in parliament but he is not a member of cabinet in this country there he is so the roles are somewhat different and if you want to look at the role of the attorney general during the brexit debates there was a scathing attack on the attorney general and he defended some part no he defended some part of the government in parliament but he admitted fairly to parliament that it was unimaginable that the government would not follow the law it was a statement made in parliament and the prime minister was held to that statement made by the attorney general and he was forced to sign a letter to the european union so if you're looking at holding people to their word and to their integrity the attorney general there did not say anything that he that was against the law he said in parliament against the wishes of the prime minister where the prime minister said i will rather die in a trough than sign this letter that was what the prime minister said in parliament the attorney general was subsequently asked for his legal opinion on it and in parliament the attorney general said it is inconceivable that this government will not follow the law which meant that the letter would be signed and delivered that day which in fact happened so if you were looking for an independent attorney general who is a politician nominated by the prime minister still having professional integrity i give you this example independence integrity because he has to go back and face his peers and his peers are not the politicians his peers are you and me and that is a shameful thing for him for him to have to go back and the peers are going to judge him badly because he cares about his reputation in the bar he may be in parliament today he may not be in parliament tomorrow but he is going to be in the bar forever 
and that name will stick to him and that worries him and therefore he will stick with this so there are several examples i can give you but this is a recent one which i thought would be helpful to understand uh, what qcs are today and uh, better we emulate that now <laughs> why not that? why not? regarding ropes particularly and and the pre audience nobody has any pre audience there's no need to be there's no need to be uh, yeah, yeah. here in india we have a uh, designated seniors they have the right of pre audience i agree i agree and uh, it is uh, but also i will tell you one other thing that uh, you may wear whatever clothes but once you open your mouth you will be found out so that is our only that is a consolation which keeps me going that uh, whatever clothes you may wear say something about uh, how good your tailor is but uh, when you open your mouth the rest is shown yes. so i have some faith in that that uh, judges and uh, ka- other counsel uh, will maybe be startled by the dress for 30 seconds but the 2 seconds after that person opens their mouth that effect is gone <laughs> two days back some notification came here in delhi accepting all all even uh, or is blazers host i think oh, it is really? only for this pandemic uh, for the pandemic only no, that the... is only you have been exempted from wearing those things for particular period during yeah. because of the summer time summer because, time because, 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 summer, you, because be, you may not be you may not be no, no probably because the, the ropes are being not washed or the given for uh, this thing the possibility of corona virus touching your body, the dress Entering into your body, they probably that may be the reason why they they. they sir, corona, being, corona will not enter, sir. Corona has got some semblance of uh, what you call. Uh, <laughs> sir, one minute. This regarding this pre-audience issue, uh, recently uh, when uh, Deepak Mishra was chief of justice, when uh, something happened because there was a urgent mentioning, you know, for list urgent listing yes. of parties. Oral mentionings were done in by the chief justice. What happened? Uh, the Uh, the, uh, the 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 he will entertain only for it for uh, th- 30 minutes because 10 that is starts 11 o'clock it will be finishing so what uh, what is happening the junior lawyers will stand, come and stand by uh, 10 o'clock before uh, the doors opens and they will stand in the queue what will happen uh, this uh, this the seniors the designated senior super seniors because, uh, yes, former yes, yes, etc they will come and they will go there and f- come if uh, stand for uh, then they will get an uh, uh, chance yeah. then yes. what happens by they will first mention then then will they will go they will do some other ma- matters and come back again for yes. <laughs> so the poor junior lawyers were standing in the queue was uh, they would never get an opportunity one day my, my one of my friend you all know, somebody of you know he mentioned in the court earlier there was a system in the court that the senior lawyers are not permitted to mention or re mention the matters so we have to immediately chief justice uh, mishra passed an order banning all seniors so seniors were losing huge money on that immediately after the retirement of <laughs> we are back the system came back that's right. absolutely now mentioning is separate because this is a right of pre audience which is enjoyed by means of section 23 yes of the cricket act yeah i understand i understand they they said with regard to justice ram kumar sir uh, statement that the advocates here they fear or uh, maybe of their uh, inferiority complex they don't want anybody from outside to come and practice no sir, it's not like that first of all if you closely read sections 29 and 33 of the advocate side 29 says that advocates alone are entitled 33 that says advocates alone which kind of advocates advocates who are enrolled under that particular statute that's advocate side they alone are entitled to practice in forums in india so as long as section 33 stands like that somebody else from abroad who may not be enrolled under this particular statute they cannot come and practice as long as the section stands then again why why the fear then <laughs> yes <laughs> you totally protect that even then that's what the point that you, i think uh, that was being made yeah if you <laughs> if by opening your mouth your words are well known to the judge <laughs> <laughs> that is a guarantee so sir uh, uh, as we come to the end of the 189th session 
we are uh, indebted to this is somaya jinu sir for uh, uh, introducing this wonderful speaker and we are thankful to you sir murli nilakanthan sir for uh, uh, opening up uh, a, a topic which usually is uh, best uh, what do you call left as such we don't want to have a i mean uh, uh, but belonging to the second oldest profession i hope it remains yes. the second oldest itself not relegate itself to the first uh, so <laughs> my uh, today uh, I, i may be excuse uh, ramachan sir because we are uh, only one time is past 1 o'clock today's lunch right. we'll have it on online <laughs> <laughs> lunch <laughs> correct so uh, we hope yeah, probably you... probably you not have ordered otherwise because once you ordered they will have to deliver it <laughs> yes sir i i go <laughs> uh, the, the way this the topic that uh, the topic itself was interesting the way the, the deliberations were going on and i was sure that uh, i should get ready with lunch so <laughs> uh uh really sir uh, it was been a wonderful experience hearing uh, uh, listening you. to you and uh, the way in which you have presented uh, and uh, the pleasantness in which the entire thing went along that itself i mean uh, we have debates we have conflicts but then an element of friction comes in here there was absolutely nothing it was so well oiled that uh, even if you had called me something bad i would have taken it and said go down most of life <laughs> <laughs> that's the current <laughs> terminology wonderful sir wonderful and uh, we thank hope you. to see you uh, in this platform quite often and with more topics uh, yeah. thank you ram uh, ram kumar sir for your uh, i mean i'd say uh, whatever uh, prem said last but the the issue still uh, remains what you mentioned sir that is uh, why are we are afraid i mean why can't they i mean uh, usually in the economic theory we believe that competition increases uh, productivity or the quality if the quality come up if you are managed <laughs> to meet somebody uh, in the court then i am otherwise whether they come or not i am inferior i need not be i mean compared to someone else to uh, declare to be declared inferior i'm sir we fear the fear that's the problem correct misplaced allergy nothing, nothing beyond that the misplaced allergy <laughs> correct, correct, correct. So, thank you all uh, once again, Ram Kumar sir, Ramakrishnan sir, Swami Ajay sir, uh, the speaker of for the day, Murli Nilakanth sir, and all of you wonderful participants for making this uh, uh, our uh, change in time. Uh, uh, I mean, I thought it would have been a disaster in the sense like uh, I mean, uh, we have been attuned in the last eighty-eight session to the four thirty. I mean, time uh, slot. So there is something like muscle memory and other memories. Likewise, I thought the seat memory will bring us back to the seat only at that particular period of time. But today it isn't so. It's wonderful that we have. Uh, uh, we are still retaining the interest, which shows that the profession does have a future. And probably, uh, Sham, as yes. a safety measure to uh, brother Ramushan, we can start at ten a.m. <laughs> Sunday, <laughs> so that so that the lunch will not be forfeited. Absolutely, sir. So I placed an alarm thrice, sir, for ten thirty, <laughs> not to not to miss the pro program. So next week, uh, uh, no, next then, Friday, then the question will be: You will have to give the grace time of half an hour, sir. <laughs> grace time of half an hour because people will be not accustomed to ten thirty always. Correct, correct. So Sunday morning. I know, sir. They, I mean, we all will get used to because the interest uh, in this uh, is what matters. True. So once again, thank you all, and do have a nice lunch, and let the profession remain noble always. Thank, thank you. you.